You are listening to the Pulse, Rod Murray's e-learning tech podcast. COVID Converted Edition number six. Interview with Jeff Borden on Education 3.0. He's talking trash. He can't get back. But he's built to last. Who was it? Jump on it. That teaser was a clip from Fuzzy Freaky Summertime by David Byrne from the Visible Man album. I'm quite a fan of David Byrne. I've seen him in concert a couple of times. Very creative guy. We're in the midst of summertime, so I thought this would be appropriate. Listen to the full song at the end of my podcast. Today's podcast episode is sponsored by D2L. You may know their main product, the Brightspace Learning Management System, I, of course, would only accept sponsorship from companies and products that I'm very fond of. So please check out their website at d2l.com slash Pulse Podcast to learn more. I also invite you to follow me on Twitter. My handle is Rods Pods. As always, I post links to the things we talk about on my show notes website at www.rodspulsepodcast.com. In this episode, I interview Jeff Borden who is the Chief Academic and Vice President of Academic Affairs at D2L. According to Dr. Borden, Education 3.0 entails a confluence of neuroscience, cognitive psychology, and education technology using web-based digital and mobile technology to help students learn efficiently. We discuss Jeff's background, history of Education 1.0 and 2.0, And by the way, if you look up Education 3.0 on Wikipedia, you'll learn all about Dr. Borden. We talk a little bit about Eric Mazur and his Confessions of a Converted Lecturer. What can we keep from the pandemic experience so far? One thing is record lectures. Students love it. We talk about neurotransmitters that enhance learning, gamification and creating novelty to enhance learning. An example is Habitable Worlds. It's a simulation at Arizona State. We talk about the Ebbinghaus forgetting curve, how drawing can enhance learning, and how community-based portals and student groups help reduce dropouts. We also discuss peer instruction and removing class barriers between upperclassmen and younger students, and of course the future of the LMS and more. Without further ado, here's my interview with Jeff Borden. Okay, Jeff, uh, so good to, to meet you. I'm really anxious to learn more about uh, what you've been doing lately and uh, how you uh, came to D2L. I know you're a new employee there uh, and, uh, and what you mean by Education 3.0. Before we get into the, to the depth of that, why don't you give us a little bit of background about yourself and how you came to uh, D2L? Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Rod. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I am, I am new to D2L. I'm about 90 days in or so. I have been in formal positions in higher education. I'm a professor. I teach in the communication department and or education department at different institutions and have my whole career. I have never taken a semester off, um, even in summers. At the same time, though, I've had administrative positions both in uh, colleges and universities, but also in companies that support colleges and universities. So, for example, uh, back in the early 2000s, I became the chief academic officer for another LMS called eCollege. That that LMS doesn't exist anymore. It was acquired by Pearson and it was turned into something called Learning Studio and then eventually sunsetted. But before that happened, uh, for my couple of years that that I overlapped with Pearson, they started sending me around the globe to sort of spread the message that I had been honing over the early years of my career about how to transform education. I've been uh, brought in to talk with ministers of education, with presidents, with provosts, with principals in K-12. Uh, since I teach education, I also have sort of a, a dual role there with working with K-20 through educators, really. And in doing that, uh, I've started to see some excellent examples and ideas of things that have worked and a lot of things that didn't work, uh, initiatives that just didn't make it. And so during that time, while I, I always really tried to look for other frameworks, learning frameworks, innovation frameworks, things like that. I eventually sort of crafted one that was meaningful to me, and it's Education 3.0. Education 3.0 is the confluence 
of neuroscience as it meets up with effectively learning science or learning design as it's supported by education technology for scale. And when you look in the middle of those three things, I believe you get to connected neural learning. Uh, I am I was lucky enough for somebody to put that into Wikipedia, so I am sort of the godfather of Education 3.0, although it's spread to some other places. There's some really interesting stuff coming out of Brazil and Korea, uh, as well as other parts of the United States. So that's, that's a little bit of my claim to fame, I guess. <laughs> interesting. You know, you, you said how you've never missed a semester, and uh, it looks like even, even with some uh, injury that's ongoing here, you're still, uh, you're still working. So... <laughs> But yes, I, I threw my back out. You're doing okay. Uh, the, the questions are really just for support. But uh, for those that are watching this, they'll they'll see me using my hands. If you don't, sorry, you're not going to get the benefit of my hands. <laughs> um, well, it's interesting. Um, you know, when when I think about um, uh, brain science uh, uh, and computers, which we're all involved with educational technology, and oftentimes uh, folks describe. Uh, computers, uh, uh, the way the brain works, or vice versa. They, they describe how the brain works, uh, uh, try to compare it to our current state-of-the-art knowledge of how computer works, computers work. Uh, does that inform any of your, your theories or your thinking about uh, Education 3.0? And, and maybe go into a little bit more about um, what's the difference between Education 1, 2, and 3. Yeah, no, that's... It's an excellent question. I, I get that question a lot, and it's good timing. I have just finished a chapter in a, a book that I'm the editor for this anthology. It'll be 15 chapters, uh, sort of a, some of the most effective practices we have for e-learning. And my chapter kicks things off by talking about Education 1.0, Education 2.0, and how we can hope to get to Education 3.0. Uh, education 1.0, from my perspective, is really when education began in a formal sense. It largely goes with the uh, invention of the printing press because, you know, the original professors were actually readers. They, it was readerships, not, not professorships. And because they could read, they would get a book of something that someone had written that they thought was Im impressive or important. And they would read it to a group of people. And that's what really became the beginnings of the traditional classroom as we know it, um, going away from sort of that apprenticeship model that had been so popular up until that point. That lasted for a while, but in the 17th century, 18th century, you started seeing what I call Education 2.0, which is a, a much more formal institutional type of uh, education. You know, you had during the Civil War, for example, President Lincoln tried to get soldiers by saying, if you are a soldier in our army, when you're done, we'll send you to college for free. And so it was something that was not any longer just for religious people or just for the richest of people but it started to become democratized a bit for the rest of the world. And so that really took us up to where we are today because we're largely still in education 2.0. Uh, the classrooms look the same. The in instructional practices are unfortunately quite often the same. Even though we kind of know better, uh, you still see very much the, uh, the strategic and intentional nature of what happened when we started to take public education for K-12 and try to create a workforce, right? So Coverly and Horace Mann, Woodrow Wilson, you know, uh, they, they said, we don't want people who are thinkers, we want people who are workers. Uh, and they, JP Morgan, they started to create that exact thing in the K-12 system. And higher ed said, well, that's what we need too because we've got so many people coming into our colleges We'll have one person, the manager, standing up at the front, telling everybody what to uh, think or write down or learn. The problem is, in the 60s or 70s, we started changing the outcome. We didn't want workers anymore. We wanted thinkers. But we didn't really change the input, and we didn't really change the throughput. So we're surprised that we haven't really gotten a different output. And that's what Education 3.0 hopes to achieve. It's interesting when um, I was trying to make a parallel. I often talk about uh, Web 1.0, Web 2.0, Web 3.0. And uh, now that we're in, I would say, Web 3.0, uh, the main distinguishing characteristic there is that the end user is allowed to have input and, and uh, 
it's more of a two-way street. Do you see that as a parallel to Education 3.0? Is there more, I mean, lately there's more um, emphasis on, you know, we talk about student-centered education. Um, does that jive with, uh, with what you're talking about in terms of Education 3.0? Very much. So the, just the notion of agency is really crucial as you start looking at um, where we should get to with education. You know, just the other day, I was watching a YouTube channel called uh, Veritasium. And the guy who runs Veritasium, he wrote his doctoral dissertation on how to teach physics through video. And so he creates these seven to 12 minute videos. They're quite brilliant. Um, but he was doing a video about learning. And he was basically making the point, uh, he, he played himself in this sort of uh, devil angel scenario. And the devil said, why, why do you always ask people these questions that they get wrong? And then you look so smug when you tell them the right answer. And he said, well, because I learned that if I just stand in front of the camera and tell you what to think, you won't learn. Uh, you may watch it, you may not, but it will wash over you passively like a television show does. I want people to learn, and that requires some conflict, and that requires some disequilibrium and some tension, and that also requires you to come to the table thinking you know one thing and then discovering you know something else. Interesting. That's very reminiscent uh, in my mind. Um, I'm blanking on the person who essentially invented um, uh, audience response systems at, at Harvard, physics. Mm. Uh, Mazur, Eric Mazur. Mazur, Eric Mazur, yeah. And uh, I saw him give a talk one time, and and it's just like you're saying, you know, he would put out a question, but he wouldn't give them the answer. People would respond, and then he would say, "Well, turn to your neighbor, and you convince right. them why why you were right." And and then he would pull the the same question to the class, and they would see the, you know, the sort of the the, the peer learning aspect there, and. Uh, and not just telling people the answer all the time. Well, and you know, he, he had that website for a while, I don't know if it's still up, called Confessions of a Converted Lecturer. And I believe he was lecturer of the year at Harvard once or twice. I mean, he, he can lecture, he knows how to do it, but he learned he doesn't give lectures anymore because of all the things you just said that students don't learn from lecture. Uh, you may get them to pay attention, you may even get them to laugh or smile or cry or whatever, but they don't learn. Uh, and so that's that's a telling component of what I hope to get to if we can get into Education 3.0. Yes, certainly this came to a head for a lot of our faculty, I think, when, uh, as uh, you know, a, a little more than a year ago, a year and a half ago, when we a lot of us converted to what I, uh, a lot of us called, uh, you know, emergency teaching on yeah. Zoom. And, you know, unfortunately, a lot of our uh, faculty were, are used to giving lectures and, you know, they've added some technology, they've added some audience response, but uh, all of a sudden they're thrown into Zoom and here you are and they want to know, well, how can I do the same thing I, <laughs> same thing I used to do in person uh, with technology? Um, what, um, tell me a little bit more about um, uh, brain theory and how this informs uh, your vision of working towards uh, Education 3.0. Well, I think it's it's important to speak to what you just you know mentioned with regard to COVID and the pandemic and remote working. We, I think, unfortunately, uh, we we got some some bad publicity that maybe wasn't quite so deserved. Um, in fact, just the other day, I read in the New York Times something about how e-learning was a a horrific failure. Uh, first of all, please know I'm not, I'm not a, an evangelist. Um, you know, I little e, I guess. Uh, I I know that a lot of people have overpromised and underdelivered for years with regard to technology, and that's just not me. But at the same time, I'm not on the other end of the spectrum. Uh, I'm not a what I call a cave person, and cave stands for colleagues against virtually everything, <laughs> right? We. Everybody knows a cave person. Um, well, if you don't, then you might be the cave person, right? So be <laughs> careful. But somewhere in the middle are reasonable, pe reasonable people with the ability to reason through how and why technology might be beneficial to you. You know, I think as, as we look at the surveys coming out of the pandemic from students, uh, Inside Higher Ed had one a couple of months ago that was really impressive. 
a, a large number of students said, here are the things from the pandemic I want to keep. One of those things was recorded lectures. Why? Because they can go back and review them. And that's obviously a problem leading up into COVID because not many instructors allow themselves to be recorded. And interestingly, it's not because they don't like the technology. That's not the argument I ever hear. It's because they're afraid of their intellectual property getting out there. Yeah. Uh, I think that there's some work that probably needs to be done in that regard. But students want it. They like it. Students want to be able to have a back channel conversation while a class experience is going on. I mean, there was a huge percentage that said, I, I like that. I want that. So as we start to look at what the brain is capable of doing, we can absolutely tie into that stuff with and or without technology. Uh, you can do some of these things in a physical classroom. Absolutely. Again, most educators don't know about those practices. They don't know about the, the seven neurotransmitters that impact learning and how we should decrease two of them and increase five of them and how to do that. They've never heard those things. So they keep doing what they've always done, which is lecture. And it washes over students passively, very much like a television show. Eric Mazur actually uh, showed that in, in those graphs where he, he hooked those students up to that device that measured their brain activity during a week you know, the only two times during the week that their brains were completely, they looked almost like they'd gone flatline or when they were watching television and when they were in a lecture. And it was the same thing. So we can get to a place where we can differentiate and vary and create novelty for people. And novelty is like candy to the brain. Um, we can generate some of those hits of dopamine and we can create norepinephrine that creates conflict by adding puzzle elements and those sorts of things. We don't do that very much, but we could. And technology could certainly underpin and, and supplant that so that we can also do it at scale. Interesting. Yeah. You know, I've, everybody that knows me know I'm, I've always been a techie. I've been, you know, uh, an early adopter of just about every technology you can imagine, both uh, education and otherwise. But um, creating novelty is important. And the, the thought that came to mind is uh, game, you know, gamification. Of, of learning and education. Does that play a role? And can you point to any specific uh, old or new technologies which, which play on that aspect? Ironically, I have uh, been a part of something I call an alternate reality learning experiences more than a dozen times. Um, and some of them we've run multiple times. My favorite one is probably one that was a multi-country experience. So we did this in both K-12 and in higher ed, two different games, if you will, but they were both in Australia, Canada, and the United States. And what we did was, again, the, the irony here is just dripping. We unleashed a pandemic on the world back in 2014, 2013. And uh, we basically said, what do you do? Well, the political science students had to act as student governments. So it was highly authentic in terms of what they were trying to accomplish, but they had to ask, do we quarantine? Do we not quarantine? Do we work with other countries? Do we uh, give money to science? Do we give money to medic medicine? How, how do we do this? We had other kinds of students, biology students, chemistry students, and different science uh, programs trying to figure out what the actual problem was. Is it bacterial? Was it viral? Was it a phage? You know, what was going on? And so six different disciplines brought their classes to bear on this experience that we use technology as the, the connector, the bridge for everybody to see the headline every morning. We would, we would come up and say how many people had died that day. And, you know, where we, we gave clues that they could use to try to figure out what was going on. Um, ultimately it all came from a, a bunch of bull riding that was going on. that was going across the oceans because you know most viruses come out of animals and then cross over into humans. But we did that in a gamified way. And the students, when we surveyed them afterward, and this is in high school as well as in college, they all said, this was the most amazing experience I've ever had in my education. Why aren't all my classes like this? And I really think that that, uh, that plays into what we're talking about here. There's the the hits of dopamine and the hits of endorphins that come as you're, as you're winning. There's also the 
controversy that you need, the creation of that norepinephrine that says, hey, I, I, I don't know this, but I think I can figure it out. I can get there, which really ties into, you know, Dweck's work with growth mindset and how that works. And then all of it, again, was underpinned by a foundation, an infrastructure of technology. Well, that's, that's interesting. That sounds like a wonderful uh, exercise. And that in, in a way you're using the technology more, like you said, as a communication medium to tie everything together. Um, can you point to other um, technologies that are doing that sort of thing uh, in a more scalable uh, version or is it something that you would see today in a, in a learning management system, for example? Yeah. So I, I think about Habitable Worlds. It was created at Arizona State. I know that made a big splash uh, a number of years ago and it's picking up steam as it goes. You know, the idea that this, again, a science professor said, I, I realize that students aren't learning when they leave general science. They, they're, not, they're not remembering it. And that goes along with what, you know, Brown put in Make It Stick and, and what, you know, how people learn have reported that when most students take that test six months after the final, even if they got an A, they're going to get about a 57%, about the same score as a person who never took the class at all, but just guessed. And so learning really is not something that happens in most educational experiences because there's just not enough repetition. There's not enough of that stuff. So he created this habitable worlds, basically simulation and said, if you want to pass this class, you've got to build a world that will sustain life. And the technology was just the place for students to create that, those patterns, put them together to create their planet. And then they have to know chemistry and they have to know biology and they have to know geology and they have to know all these different sciences. And he found that not only did they learn the information deeply, but they remembered it much, much longer than their peers who were in a biology class alone, a chemistry class alone. Uh, and he tested them long after the fact, and they still retained that information because it was so practical. It was so authentic. They used it. Uh, it was so engaging and at the same time, so active. Yeah, they, I think that's another quote that I, I remember from Eric Mazur saying, really, you know, learning does not take place in the lecture. Far from right. it. You know, it takes place later when you're going back and you're studying, you may be re-watching uh, a recorded lecture, um, doing your own reading or studying in, in small groups. Um, are there technologies that, that you would like to see incorporated into uh, an LMS, say something like D2L? Yeah, so uh, luckily uh, I'm having those conversations right now with our product teams. There are really two uh, different technologies that I don't think are on the radar of most LMSs. I think they should be, um, maybe three. Uh, one of them has to do with the spacing effect with the Ebbinghaus curve, just this notion that everybody has a degree of fade out with regard to any piece of information. You know, you start to forget it immediately after you hear it the first time. And if we can remind people just before they forget it, they'll remember it twice as long. And then if we can remind them again, just before they forget it, they'll remember twice as long again. So we can really use a learning management system and put the learning back into it <laughs> and say, this will help you learn. This can, you know, you can come in and say, I've got to know these 10 concepts. And then we can pop them up in front of you on the right cadence so that you, you will remember something. At the same time, when Bill Gates left uh, Microsoft, he said, you know, the most important computer element that's going to take over and be dominant in the next 20 years is the pen, the stylus. And while I don't know that it's come to fruition quite as much as he hoped it would, I agree from a learning perspective, when you draw things, it is tremendously powerful for, a learn for learning. Uh, most people, if you've never seen Dr. Stephen Carroll's note-taking techniques, the magic happens when you not only write on the left side of the page what the ahas are in as few words as possible, by the way, but on the right side, you draw it, you doodle it, you sketch it. And then at the bottom, you can put a summary and people remember 11 to 14% more of that information because they drew it. And it's especially helpful if you can't draw. You know, ironically, I, I talk about this with professors all the time. I show them these techniques. And their answer to me all the time is, well, I don't know how to draw. I'm not an artist. Well, neither am I. But it's actually better because now I have to figure out cognitively 
what did I mean by that? Why did I draw that stick figure? How did that work? And so as you start to look at those two things, those can give you tremendous hooks. Uh, as, as an instructor, if I put up a, a nice, rich, high fidelity slide of a, of a heart, and I show you a, that, you know, 64 labels on that heart, the red al elements, the blue elements, all, how it all works, you're going to observe it passively, very much like a TV show. However, if I draw it as the instructor, now you have to use your imagination. You have to use your brain to start to figure out how those pieces work together. Plus, I can dismiss some of the cognitive load by saying, you don't need 64 labels. You need these four. These are the things that matter. But even better than that, if I put you in a shared whiteboard space with three other students and I say, hey, why don't you draw a heart for me? And if I do that, maybe on the first day before we've talked about the heart, before you've read about the heart, that's called generative learning. That's what Brown talks about and make it stick. And in generative learning terms, if myself and three peers go in and try to draw a heart, the instructor can immediately see that heart and say, wait a minute, you drew that symmetrically. Why would you draw a heart symmetrically? Part of it has to be much stronger than the other part because it pumps. And that aha moment for the learner comes in as they go, oh, yeah, let, let me erase that and let me make it. You're right. It, it does that. They will hold on to that for a long time. Well, so, you know, it, it's, it's interesting yeah. that that uh, stirred up some memories because um, <clears throat> I've, I've given up handwriting. I type just about everything, but... I do like to scribble and make notes. And I, I remember when I was uh, in graduate school studying uh, neuroanatomy, and I remember staying up nights and drawing on this big poster board just for my own studying and, and drawing, you know, the brain and the, and the cranial nerves and labeling everything. And, that, and that's really how I learned. And I think you're right. There, there's, there's not as much... Um, Students are not, don't seem to be uh, uh, encouraged to do that. Uh, that seems to, in some ways to be a, a lost art. And the other thing that occurred to me is what, what part publishers are playing because, you know, I think there's some new ones that are sort of, uh, or some, some publishers that are, that are branching out. But for the longest time, they were just interested in selling textbooks. And, right. and I'm not sure how that's helped in, in, in education. They could be doing so much more. And we talked about, you know, uh, uh, interactive textbooks and, and so on. Is, is there any other uh, technologies coming up from the um, publishing companies that are helping to lead to uh, Education 3.0? Um, helping to lead there, I don't know. Uh, so I agree with you, you know, an irony here is that we have known since, I don't know, the mid seventies about the concept of interleaving that when the human brain thinks it doesn't think in sequence, it doesn't think in complete context. And yet, if you look at how most textbooks are set up and then therefore how most classes are set up, well, you cover chapter one in week one and chapter one covers everything you need for chapter one. And then you move on to chapter two, which may or may not have much to do with chapter one. And then week two, therefore, may or may not have much to do with week one. That's not how people learn. That's not optimal. And so in that way, the, the, the book paradox really, uh, while it has great information, it is not designed in such a way that it actually helps people contextualize that by taking pieces of chapter one, bringing some pieces from chapter four up into chapter one, and moving some of the elements of chapter one into chapter two, three, four, five, that's how it should work. It doesn't. And so uh, we, we can get kind of caught with that. There are some technologies, however, that very much fit into Education 3.0 that I don't know of any that come from a publisher, but something like um, a portal experience that is community-based. You know, it's highly functional. If you look at Michael Lee Stollard and his book, Connection Culture, he talks about connection being a uh, connection, not just to people, but to process and to productivity. So if you look at, you know, some of these products out there uh, like Campus, and, and I, I used to be affiliated with them, we brought them into St. Leo as one of the tools that we used. Not only could you get to every system that you needed you know, on one screen, it was the landing page for everybody, but we also had groups. And the reason that groups were there is because we know, again, from brain science, as well as from learning research, that two-thirds of students are at risk not for cognitive reasons, 
they're at risk because they're lonely. You know, 7% of students drop out, fail out, or transfer out because they're lonely. Well, they don't have to be. We can give them more opportunities to meet people than just saying, hey, go to campus and I hope you make a friend. Don't know. They can have those groups and, and things digitally as well and start to connect with people that are in other modalities, start to connect with the online student as well as with the face-to-face -face student. And then they can also get support and they can get to the, the registrar's office using the app, not having to go face-to-face -face on a Tuesday when they happen to be working. I mean, we know this stuff. And so if you start to create a learning ecosystem, uh, it's not just the traditional LMS. It's actually a way to help learners in a holistic way, you know, like the learning triangle. You look at them cognitively, you look at them affectively, and you look at them cognitively. Yeah, you know, it. Uh, I, I recall in the in the '90s uh, there was a change. I, I was at a, uh, you know, most familiar with the medical curriculum back then, and they they changed from discipline specific, you know, to then more systems. In fact, I was in the process. I was editing a uh, a series on pharmacology by the by the, and it was supposed to be in one volume, right? This this the pharmacology was in this one volume. By the time it got published, they they teased apart you know, cardiovascular pharmacology, they put it with the heart and they put pulmonary pharmacology with, with the lungs and so forth. So, yeah, it seems to me that, and, and then what you're saying too is, <clears throat> is more in the lines of, um, you know, uh, peer instruction. I mean, in fact, there's probably a good argument for not uh, segregating the different class levels, right? You want to have the older, more experienced students help, help teach uh, the younger students. You know, the, for two reasons. One, and the, the argument you often hear against that is, well, it brings the older students back. It holds them back. It really doesn't. It helps them cement what they have learned because they now have to recontextualize it to communicate with this other person and say, okay, you're not getting it because of what the book says, or you're not getting it because of what the instructor says. Let me try a different way. And it really helps them learn much more deeply as they do that. And then obviously there are benefits to the new learner who can hear it in a different way, hear it with language that may be a little more common for them. There's so much benefit to that if it's set up quite intentionally, not just, hey, get into groups and talk, but actually given some intentional instruction, it can really make a difference for both sides of that equation. Well, that's, that's, that's really true. I mean, it, um, you know, like they say, you really don't learn something until you teach it. And, yeah. and that, that was certainly a way, way to do it. Well, listen, I know we're getting near the end of our, our time, and I've, I've learned a lot. I wish, I wish there was, you know, I had some input into, uh, into building an a online division of our, um, of our university and um, very, you know, fairly traditional in terms of uh, textbooks and week one and week two. And uh, I would love to see more of this experimentation and, um, building uh, really a community of, of learners, maybe not segregating the, the different uh, um, students and the different uh, disciplines, but having more opportunities for them to, uh, to come together and learn together. Uh, no, let, let me give you a story for that really yeah. quick. Sure. So Richard Light did that cross, you know, functional longitudinal study back uh, in the 90s, from 1990 to 2000. Ten years he did this study. And he and his research team went out and gave thousands and thousands of surveys to students at Ivy Leagues, R1s, community colleges. And when he got done with that 10 years, he found that the single most significant factor for student success was joining a group. And that group needed to last throughout the entirety of their experience. It wasn't a, a learning community in a class. It wasn't just getting together with a tutor. It was joining a study group. In 1990, when the biology and, and other science departments started coming to Richard Light saying, hey, will you find out why so many of our students are leaving, why they quit our program and go to other programs? He found this out. He said, well, the ones who stay join study groups, which by the way, in 1990, at most of those schools was considered cheating. That was actually inappropriate. He started telling these deans and chairs and department heads, and they, by 1995 or so, they started requiring people to join these groups. And so they actually jumped up from, I think, 48% uh, of students were staying majors to 63% staying majors in 2000. Wow. 
after they require them to join a group. Groups matter. We're, we're humans. We need that connection. Well, uh, I want to be um, uh, respectful of your time and my yeah. audience. Uh, I wonder if you, can you sum up um, any, I guess, efforts that are going forward that uh, might impact uh, those of us who um, use D2L or, or, or think, you know, influences that, that you can um, uh, help to push through D2L. Can you give us any hints of what's, what's coming in that regard? You bet. So as far as the future of the LMS, uh, we're really having some, some conversations, I think, that are quite meaningful at D2L with, again, some important people, not necessarily the old guard. Uh, we're talking with brain, science and, brain scientists, and we're talking with learning scientists. We're talking with some people from other streams so as to hopefully build a bigger, better learning ecosystem. Uh, not just, hey, what will the LMS look like in 10 years? But what does that learning ecosystem look like in three years? And how does the LMS fit inside of that and wrap, have something wrap around it so that we're actually getting to a place where we're dealing with people affectively, we're giving them places to connect, we're giving them places to get support, and we're dealing with them cognitively. How are we helping them with regard to their mindset and their grit and their tenacity and their resilience and their open-mindedness while also always dealing with them cognitively? which the LMS has really wrapped up pretty nicely for a long time. But it's those other two elements, affection and conation, that we really need to focus on. And at D2L, we're starting to have those conversations right now. I think people will start to see the fruits of that labor very, very, very soon in two, three years at most. Great. Well, that's, that's really encouraging. And uh, I'm really happy that uh, D2L... Uh, had the foresight to bring somebody like you on board and uh, I wish you the best of luck and thank you so much for uh, talking to me today. I learned a lot. Oh, thanks, Rod. It was my pleasure. Thanks so much. That's it for this episode. I hope you learned as much as I did from Dr. Borden and now stay tuned for the full song Fuzzy Freaky Summertime by David Byrne. Until next time, have a great week. She's scandalized And I'm changing size Who was it? Jump on it He's talking trash And he can't get back But he's built to last Who was it? Jump on it
that's it for today's episode. Thank you very much for listening. Don't forget to give Rod feedback. You can leave comments on his blog or send email to rod at rodspulsepodcast.com. The preceding audio commentary is the product of the author, Dr. Rodney Murray, and does not represent the official viewpoint of any other institution or company. Yeah.